So the general idea of vector quantization is you have a lot of data and you want to compress uh, the data so that you need either less bandwidth if you transmit the data or le less memory if you store the data. And you do that by representing the vectors by reference vectors. So let's assume we have a coordinate system and we have some data points. Then, I mean, if this would be a 10 dimensional space, then for each point that you want to transmit, you need 10 numbers, 10 floating point numbers or so. Now, if we assume that we have some representative reference vectors, like here, there, okay, make it big, and here, and there, and you don't have to convey the data exactly, so then for every data point that is in this area, you could simply send the index of this reference vector. You have to transmit the reference vectors themselves, of course, it would be 4 times 10 numbers in this case, but from then on you just have to tell which reference vector is closest uh, to the data point um, and that way you could convey the data. So that would then be just 2 bits rather than 10 floating point numbers. Now how would you place the reference vectors so that the whole thing works as as well as it can? And for that we typically define a, an error function and the very natural error in this case would be uh, the mean square distance. That is this one here. So we have these reference vectors R and we have the data points X and since we do not transmit the data points but just the reference vectors. The error that we make for each data point is the distance of the data point to the nearest reference vector um, or the reference vec vector that we choose to represent the data point and that's I star. And I star of course changes depends on the on the uh, data point so it depends on you if you like. And averaging the distance between the data points and the reference vectors of our all data points uh, square that sort of squ average the square distance that would be our error function. Now given this error function you can sort of ask two questions. So the one is if you assume that you have placed the reference vectors what would be the optimal assignment of the data points to these reference vectors? And that's a relatively simple uh, thing. I mean, it's quite obvious that each data vector should be assigned to the nearest reference vector. So that would be this. So you look, you go th through all the reference vectors, i, <coughs> and you look for the reference vector that is closest to the data point, and that index is the index that's that's chosen, or that reference vector is being chosen. <clears throat> this naturally leads to the concept of Voronoi tessellation. Oh, we can actually go back to the picture that we had already. Um, so in this picture you can sort of two, do two things. One is you can actually go through the individual data points and 
always calculate the distance to all the reference vectors, and that's algorithmically uh, probably what you would do. But conceptually, it's interesting to partition the space so that you know that the data points lying in one partition always um, are always assigned to uh, a particular reference vector. So what would be the appropriate partitioning of that space? So let me first draw the lines lines between the reference vectors. That would be this one, for instance. This one. This one. This one. And this one. Something like that. Now, if you consider just one of these lines, for instance, if you consider this line here, and if you pretend only these two reference vectors, oh, maybe we actually remove the line so that's not so cluttered here our drawing. Um, so if we if we assume for the moment that we only have these two reference vectors, so how would the border between these two reference vectors or border look that splits the that separates the data points that are assigned to that reference vector and those um, assigned to that reference vector. And that's quite obvious. I mean, we have the connecting line, and if you take the mid-section here, and that by accident sort of more or less lies on on this axis. So this would be sort of the the line that would separate the points that are assigned to this reference vector and to this reference vector, right? And this obviously would be a um, 90 degree angle, and it would sit right in the middle between the two points. Yeah? So this is how you would construct the separation for two reference vectors. Now, if you have several reference vectors, like in our example, you simply repeat the process, and now I'm going back to my lines. Oops. So we have this line, with this line, with this line. Okay, now for each of these lines we can construct the line that splits the connecting line and is perpendicular to it. So that would look like... Okay, so the line here would be... Maybe, well, no, that's not. Okay, let's do this one, and then let's do this one, and Oh, well, that's a little bit puzzling now here. So this would be... Yeah. And we, exactly, we have... We have a line here. Somewhere. Oops, not a perfect drawing. Yeah. So now that's interesting here because of this uh, sort of the, the constellation of the reference vectors. Uh, the connecting line here has this 
midline. Uh, so this uh, this green line belongs to this orange line. This green line belongs to this orange line. This green line to this orange line. This green line to this orange line. And this green line to this orange line. Yeah. And maybe just for clarification, I redraw the reference vectors. So one is here, one is here, one is here, and one is here. And my, maybe I also redraw this line. So, okay, good. So the green thing is called a Vernoy tessellation. And the orange graph is called a Delaunay triangulation. And we have seen that sort of each orange line corresponds to one of the green lines. And in this drawing, the only line that's missing, the only orange line that's missing is from this, is from this reference vector to, to this ver reference vector. And the reason is, um, that they don't share a border. No, I mean, if there was no need to draw a green line uh, somewhere in the middle between this and this reference vector because uh, we have this reference vector in between. So if two nodes don't share a border, you don't draw um, an orange line and you don't draw a corresponding green line, of course, because that's a missing border. Okay, so that's, as I said, in the algorithm you would ju just go through the points and calculate the distances in the simplest way. I mean, there are smarter ways to do this if you have very high dimensional spaces or many points, but that's something you can do. And then, um, but this green, the Voronoite selection is a nice concept. Okay, so this is how you could formalize Voronoi, a uh, Voronoi uh, tessellation. So that is, um, all the points that would be assigned to a particular reference vector. Yeah? So all the points x for which this equation would be true. Yeah, so this is the Voronoi. Also, partition space such that all points within one partition get assigned to one reference vector. Okay, and we've also already talked about the Delaunay triangulation. That's more a side remark. We don't need that here for our algorithm. But it's useful for uh, finding shortest paths and things like this. So it's useful in many contexts, but not for vector quantization. Okay, so this was the one question. How would you assign the data points to the reference vectors? Now, the other question is, how do you position the reference vectors if an assignment is given? Um, so, if an assignment is given, we can consider each reference vector independent uh, of the others and look at the error that for that particular reference vector, and that would be this term, where we have one fixed reference vector and we sum over uh, the squared distance for those data points that are assigned to that reference vector, and that's expressed here by this set m of i and m sub i. Um, now, how would you figure that out? Uh, well, uh, if you have a function that depends, so in this case, this function depends on r, on the co components of r. Uh, if you have something like this and you want to find the optimum, 
typically you set the derivatives to zero and then you solve the equation. That's what's, what's being done down here. So we calculate the gradient of the error function with respect to the components of R. Um, that would be this thing here. And then we rearrange the things a little bit because R does not depend on the data points. You can take this out of the averaging process. We swap the two positions to get rid of the sign. And then we have simply this. So two times R minus the average of X should be zero. Now, and that means R should actually be the average position of X. And that's simply the center of gravity. Yeah. So the optimal reference vectors the optimal reference vectors lie in the center of gravity of the data vectors assigned to them. So now this sounds simple, right? I mean you simply assign all the data points to the nearest reference vector and position the um reference vectors uh, in the center of gravity of the data points assigned to them. The problem is that um, the assignment mine might um, change due to the shifting of the reference vectors. So assume we have something like, uh, so we have data points lying like this. And we have one reference vector here, one reference vector there. We have a Voronoi tessellation with a border here. And now if you move the reference vector into the center of gravity, this reference vector would end up somewhere here. Yeah, and this vector might shift a little bit to the left. Yeah, so so far so good. Uh, but the problem now is that if we now do a reassignment, or that after this shift, the assignment of the data points to the reference vectors is not optimal anymore. One would, if one would assign them anew, one would split maybe. Oops. Split maybe here, and um, I mean, and that in turn uh, makes the position of the reference vector suboptimal. So we have to move them again, and then the border changes again. So there's an sort of back and forth between shifting the reference vectors and finding a new optimal assignment. So this is an iterative process. And, but it's one that converges rather quickly, so it doesn't take, take long. Um, so that means the, the algorithm now reads as follows. So first we initialize the reference vectors. And a smart way of doing this, or a good way of doing this, is to assign them, or to position them at, um, existing data points, because otherwise you might run into a problem of the following kind. So again, uh, we have a number of reference vectors and, no, sorry, data points. And if you would somehow arbitrarily initialize your reference vectors, one might end up here and the other one might end up here. And if you now look at the Bournoi tessellation, it's quite obvious uh, It's quite obvious that one reference vector doesn't get any data points, so it's useless. It's a, it would be a dead reference vector. So you make you want to make sure that a reference vector gets at least one data point, and therefore it's good to initialize them um, to existing reference vectors, uh, data points. <coughs> 
Okay, but then and then you alternate between the two processes of finding the assignment of the data vectors to the nearest reference vector, which is easy to do, and you move each reference vector to the center of gravity of the data that ha has been assigned to them. And you simply repeat this, this is an iterative algorithm, until convergence, and convergence means uh, that the assignment does not change anymore, and therefore also the position of the reference vector does not change anymore.